Welcome to Movie Plots, today we take a look back at the 1995 post-apocalyptic action film Waterworld. Spoilers ahead. The polar ice caps have melted, covering the earth in an endless ocean, survivors have had to adapt to living atop it. We meet a lone survivor known only as the Mariner, who drinks his filtered urine aboard his ocean vessel. One day he goes diving in search of artifacts to trade, and while scavenging the ocean floor, his lime tree gets raided. When the Mariner gets back on board he checks out his new stuff. Before noticing the drifter's boat, and holding him at harpoon point. The Mariner recognizes the vessel but not the man, and suspects he killed the owner. The drifter insists he found the boat with the owner already dead, and he tells him of a place nearby to resupply. They spot two jet skis in the distance ridden atop by smokers, pirates named for their use of oil to fuel their machines. The pirates begin to close in on the pair, and without thinking the mariner has enough time to catch him, the drifter mockingly tells him he stole his limes. The angry mariner hits custom levers and loosens ropes, extending the sails beyond expectation of the drifter, giving the mariner enough speed to retrieve his haul from the ocean, and catch back up to the drifter. He sails straight over top of him, breaking the drifter's sail and leaving him marooned for the smokers. A few days later the mariner arrives at a settlement atop the water. After being denied entry by the enforcer, he reveals a jar of dirt, the most precious substance in the world, and is given admittance. Inside the walls he sees the people are starving, and are shown recycling a dead person. The mariner is given one hour to conduct his business by the town's enforcer, and the town's banker offers him a large amount of money for the dirt. We see a man at the bar named Noor, asking around about a girl with a supposed map to dry land tattooed on her back. The bar owner Helen sells the mariner some fresh water which they call Hydro, when he is approached by Noor. But after Noor sees the tattooed girl who is in the care of Helen, he leaves. The mariner then buys from Helen a tomato bush, and all the shelves in her store. On his way back to his boat, he is asked by two local elders to impregnate their daughter, wanting to avoid inbreeding within the colony. He refuses, and since no one refuses sex in this world, they assume he is a smoker spy and have him arrest him. When the crowd discovers that he is a mutant due to his gills, gills, they begin to attack him. He jumps in the water to get away, but after killing one of them, is captured in a net. Before the crowd can kill him, the enforcer defends the mariner, saying the death was just self-defense, but still locking him up indefinitely. At night the locals steal all his belongings, including Noor, who takes his boots and slips out the front gate. We meet Helen's eccentric friend Gregor, who says that they should leave the town as too many people know about Enola's tattoo, though no one including himself knows how to read it. While drawing pictures of horses and the mariner, Enola says that maybe he knows how to read it, prompting Gregor to go speak with the mariner, where he inspects his webbed feet and gills. I'm excited. While asking about dry land, the mariner asks Gregor to free him, but both are interrupted by the enforcer and Gregor flees. The next day the town has made up its mind, they decide to kill the mariner, lowering him into the compost pit. Just then a lookout spots an armada of smokers descending on the town, and the town prepares for a battle. The smokers are led by a warlord named the Deacon, who outguns the small settlement tenfold. As the smokers attack the town, they begin to impregnate the walls, causing chaos in the settlement. Gregor accidentally activates his escape plan, a giant hot air balloon that begins to inflate. Before Helen and Enola can get on board, he floats out of the building and drifts away. Enola points out the mariner, and before he drowns in the sinking cage, Helen sets him free on the condition he takes them with him. The mariner takes back his trimaran, and we see that Nor was a smoker spy. The three work together to open the front gate to the town, and manage to slip through. When the deacon orders his gunner to shoot them, the mariner uses the harpoon to drag the gunner into his line of fire blowing up the deacon's pontoon and letting the group escape. Though with the deacon only losing an eye, and learning that the girl he's searching for was on board the vessel, he now hunts the mariner. We gotta keep an eye out. Helen asks the mariner if he knows how to get to dry land, and he gives Helen the impression that he does, but he also says that they should abandon Enola, as she is useless and will eat all their food. Because she is keen on keeping Enola, Helen offers herself to the mariner, but he rejects her. Helen pulls out a harpoon rifle and insists they all head for dry land together. But the mariner drops his sail on her trapping her underneath, and uses an oar to knock her out. He spends the remainder of the day maintaining watch from the top of his sail. The smoker's home base is a rusty oil tanker, and when the ship doctor's effort to give the deacon a false eye fails, it does look like shit. the deacon makes himself an eye patch. He hands out smokes to his citizens and inspects the oil supply of the ship, finding that his ship is losing oil at a fast rate. Hello. 
The deacon sends out a plane to look for Enola, since he insists that finding her is their first priority. The pilot eventually finds the group and begins firing on them. The mariner gets ready to fire a weapon at the plane, but Helen harpoons the plane, killing the gunner but attaching the aircraft to the vessel. The mariner climbs his sail to cut the rope, but the pilot is able to blast the plane free, throwing the mariner into the water. He then cuts off Helen and Enola's hair, and tells them not to touch anything on his boat without his consent. Did you say something? The pilot returns to the deacon and informs him of the mariner's location. Bitch. So the deacon and Nor set a trap for him. Later on the mariner comes across another drifter, and the group makes a trade for food. The drifter has begun to go mad after being so long at sea, and asks to trade paper for a half hour with Helen. Helen and the drifter descend below deck as the mariner examines the paper, but eventually goes down and calls the transaction off. Helen returns to the top while the drifter pulls a knife on the mariner. After dumping his body, they loot his boat. The mariner drags himself behind the boat as bait, and when a giant sea creature eats him, he blows his way out, and the three eat well. Enola claims she is incapable of swimming, so the next day the mariner impresses Helen by teaching Enola how to swim, forging a relationship between them. They arrive at a slaver outpost a few days later, but attempts to speak with them get no response. The mariner uses an underwater periscope to see that the smokers are waiting to ambush them. He manages to avoid getting trapped in their nets, but the deacon shoots him as they get away. The mariner claims that despite having traveled farther than anybody else, he has never seen dry land. Helen inquires about the items on the mariner's boat that no one else has ever seen, and wonders where he obtained them. The mariner agrees to show Helen where dry land is, and takes her to the ocean floor with a diving bell, showing her a ruined city, and the place he gets the dirt from. As they return to the surface, a crew of smokers and the deacon arrive and take Enola. The mariner keeps Helen alive underwater by breathing for both of them, and the two return to the surface to a torched vessel. But make the most of it. In the morning Gregor finds them in his hot air balloon and brings them to survivors of his settlement. After the mariner finds Enola's tree drawings in his Nat Geo, he realizes dry land might actually exist and promises to go save Enola. He uses a craft to locate the oil tanker and while the deacon gathers on deck for his lecture, the mariner sneaks aboard. The smokers begin to use enormous oars in an attempt to save oil. The mariner shows up topside demanding for Enola's release, holding a flare over a pipe that leads directly to the oil storage. When the deacon calls him on it, the mariner drops the flare, much to the oil reader's delight. Oh, thank God. The deacon attempts to flee with Enola in his plane, but after the mariner deals with Nor, he intercepts them with an old anchor cable. Gregor and the other survivors arrive in the balloon and lower a rope for the mariner to grab. As the deacon grabs the rope and begins climbing, Enola kicks him off. Shooting at the balloon, the deacon knocks Enola off and into the ocean, and signals two smokers to get her. The mariner creates a bungee cable and jumps down to save Enola, causing the deacon and other smokers to collide. Gregor examines the map on Enola's back once more, and has a lightbulb moment, realizing the markings are longitude and latitude. After several days of flying in the direction of the map, the mariner spots a seagull perched on the ship one morning, and dry land behind it. They arrive to find fresh water, mountains, trees, and even a village. Two skeletons are discovered in a hut, and seeing the tattoo needles, and a music box that plays the song Enola would hum, they realize it's her parents. Everyone is happy to have finally reached dry land, but the mariner feels out of place, and makes plans to leave them. As he departs, a sad Enola gives him her music box to remember her, and the mariner vows to tell the others about dry land. As Helen and Enola watch him sail away from the mountain, they realize they are standing on the peak of Mount Everest. And the movie ends. Waterworld was directed by Kevin Reynolds and co-written by Peter Rader and David Tui. Based upon Rader's original 1986 screenplay and stars Kevin Costner, who also produced it with Charles Gordon and John Davis. Kevin Costner personally invested $22 million of his own money into the film, and prior to Titanic two years later, this was the most expensive movie ever produced. Gene Hackman, James Caan and Gary Oldman all turned down the role of the Deacon, with Samuel L. Jackson turning it down in order to be in Die Hard the same year. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more.